So a warm welcome to all of you who joined us today uh, for a discussion of the annexes of the additional protocol, um, of the model addition to the model additional protocol and uh, the uh, technological developments that, that have been uh, part of the several decades that uh, after the, their adoption. Um, my name is Yelena Sokova, I'm the Executive Director of the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. And uh, we are, are recording this webinar, but I also wanted to note for those of you who joined, please, uh, if you have questions, use the Q&A function as usual. Uh, those watching on YouTube, please uh, send us your questions uh, to uh, events at vcdnp.org. And uh, we will dive in right into the discussion with my short introduction. First about the origins of the, this project. Um, in 2019, the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation published a report on the IAEA safeguards staying ahead of the game who was, uh, had, the report was written and headed by Laura Rockwood, who was the executive director at that time, and who many of you know. And one of the recommendations from this report was to uh, look at the uh, possible updates to the annexes to the model additional protocol um, to improve effectiveness and efficiency of the safeguard system. In 2019 and uh, through 2021, the VCDNP also held a three-part series of workshops, specifically looking at the new uh, and advanced and, and new technologies, nuclear and non-nuclear, but also some advanced nuclear technologies and their potential impact on safeguards and on export control. And that uh, discussion also recommended for us to uh, look closely at how some of these technological developments uh, should be uh, better integrated into the uh, effectiveness and efficiency of safeguards. So with that in mind, uh, the VCDNP launched last year a project to look at these new technological developments uh, that are not currently covered under annexes to the model additional protocol. And also do a, a, a kind of impartial technical assessment of the significance uh, for um, safeguards. Uh, we are very grateful that the United Kingdom Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office was able to support uh, this project. And today um, you will hear the results of uh, our uh, assessment and discovery in terms of um, some of the technologies that we think are worth for us to look at and see uh, whether their uh, reflection in the annexes uh, should be um, uh, updated or uh, corrected at some point. I'm very delighted that uh, our own VCDNP research associate, Noah Mayhew, um, led this project uh, among the VCDNP group. And he invested very heavily <laughs> into the subject. He's our own VCDNP safeguards nerd. And uh, uh, he will be it. Uh, providing uh, the results of the study. But I'm also extremely delighted that we have um, two well-known uh, and, and internationally recognized experts joining us with comments on the project and the report. Uh, first and foremost, Laura Rockford, who is the director of the Open Nuclear Network here in Vienna, but also well-known as uh, the queen of safeguards. Um, 
And uh, Jim Casterton, who um, is currently consulted, but who also spent many years working uh, on safeguards uh, and on export control issues, both with the Canadian uh, nuclear regulator at the International Atomic Energy Agency and the, the diplomatic he mission here in Vienna. And both uh, Jim and Laura were involved in the negotiations and development of the model additional protocol. So I'm really grateful you were able to join us. Without further ado, Noah, why don't you start us away? Thank you very much, Helena. Uh, let me quickly share my screen and we can get this show on the road. And thank you also for that very kind introduction. Um, first, I must ask, is this displaying correctly? Elena, you're muted. I yeah. showed the thumbs, all good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, thank you, sorry. So it is my uh, great pleasure to present, as Elena said today, the results of a VCDNP project for which I was the lead after uh, over the past seven months, uh, which looks at the annexes to the model additional protocol, in particular, how one might envision them being updated uh, in order to improve the effectiveness and the efficiency of IAEA safeguards. While this is a VCDNP project, uh, I speak today based on my own takeaways from the project. First, a few notes about the model additional protocol itself. Uh, as many of you will know, in the 1990s, the IAEA and its member states engaged in a range of activities to strengthen the effectiveness and improve the efficiency of the safeguard system, largely as a response to the discovery of Iraq's clandestine nuclear weapons program. One result of this was the Model Additional Protocol, which was approved by the Board of Governors in 1997. The Model Additional Protocol is a voluntary measure, it's supplementary to safeguards agreements concluded with the agency, and an additional protocol based on the model, for example, in the case of additional protocols concluded with non-nuclear weapon states under the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, provides the IAEA with more tools to verify the absence of undeclared nuclear activities or material in a state. Part of the way that APs uh, accomplish this is through expanded reporting requirements, some of which are enshrined in the model additional protocols to annexes. Annex 1 requires states with APs based on the model to provide a description of the scale of operations for the locations engaged in the activities described in this annex. The activities listed in Annex 1 reflect key choke points in the nuclear fuel cycle that could be used to produce weapons usable nuclear material. They are related to the manufacture, assembly, or upgrading of certain equipment and materials related to enrichment, reactor operation, heavy water production, and the reprocessing of spent fuel. If one looks at Annex 1, most but not all of the activities refer to manufacturing, but as will be discussed, there is no requirement that these activities must involve manufacturing. Annex 2 requires states with additional protocols, again, based on the model, to provide uh, trade data pertaining to international transfers of specified equipment and non-nuclear material listed in Annex 2. That includes the identity, quantity, location of intended use, and the date of export of the specified items, and the IAEA can also request confirmation of that information from the importing state. The list of equipment and non-nuclear material required to be reported under Annex 2 was based on the list adopted by the Board of Governors in connection with the voluntary reporting scheme, originally approved in 1993, uh, and then later updated a few times. Um, uh, when, and that list was in turn based on Annex B, uh, the trigger list of the nuclear suppliers group which was chosen just as a practical matter as um, a way to avoid having to uh, negotiate an entirely new list. It's important to note here that while the items listed in Annex 2 are especially designed and prepared for the most part, or EDP, there is no requirement for them to be so. So to say, Annex 2, like Annex 1, uh, can include anything that is deemed to be important for uh, ensuring the effectiveness and efficiency of safeguards. As I said, the model additional protocol approved by the board in 1997, and that includes the two annexes. The annexes, however, uh, have not been updated since then. Uh, meanwhile, the pace of technological advancement has increased along the nuclear fuel cycle. 
So the good news in this regard is that the model additional protocol contains a provision for the update of the annexes, which is a relatively simple provision compared with other international treaties. Article 16b of the model additional protocol states that the annexes may be updated by the board based on the advice of an open-ended working group of experts that the board would establish. Should the board establish such a working group and accept its recommendations, all additional protocols would be amended automatically four months after the approval of that amendment. However, and this is the raison d'etre for our discussion today, 25 years on, the provision to establish this open-ended working group has not been utilized. Now, I should note, it is for the member states to decide how and if the annexes are to be updated. As such, as a safeguards uh, specialist, I'll say, uh, our task is, you know, we designed it was to, to put the cards on the table. So to say, to conduct an impartial technical assessment of the technologies that are not covered under the annexes to demonstrate the value added for safeguards, effectiveness and efficiency, were they to be included. In order to do this, we thought through three different prisms, if you will. Uh, the first is something is a reference to something that the then director of the IAEA Safeguards Department's Division of Concepts and Planning, Richard Cooper, said during the negotiations of the model additional protocol itself. The discussion was about whether to include tritium, beryllium metal, and boron tin into Annex 1, though none of them were included in order to secure consensus for the document. Richard Cooper made the argument that <clears throat> While beryllium metal and boron 10, which are used for reflectors and control rods, respectively, they were indicative of a process resulting in nuclear material. They were not what he called necessary and sufficient conditions for such a process. In other words, while beryllium and boron are indicative of such a process, their presence is not in itself evidence of nuclear activity. The mere existence of tritium, however, means that there is nuclear material somewhere. Even so, as I said, there is no requirement that the annexes contain specifically single use items or those which inherently are evidence of the production of nuclear material. An example of this um, is uh, demonstrated by the composition of nuclear grade graphite. Nuclear grade graphite is contained both in Annex 1 and in Annex 2. Um, nuclear grade graphite has become much more accessible in the last 25 years or so, making a lot of the graphite that's on the market nuclear grade. But certainly not all graphite, which is nuclear grade, is evidence of a nuclear activity at this point. We also included, uh, considered rather, the principle of especially designed or prepared, or EDP, as I mentioned a moment ago. This language comes from the NPT's Article 3.2, and that reads that each state party to the treaty undertakes not to provide equipment or material especially designed or prepared for the processing, use, or production of special fissionable material to any non-nuclear weapon state unless it is under IAEA safeguards. While this is a useful prism to look through when interpreting the annexes or considering how they might be updated, I'll say again, there is no requirement that the items in the annexes be EDP. In fact, this is why the title of Annex 2 refers to specified equipment and non-nuclear material rather than something more narrow. And finally, we considered other equipment and materials that, in our view, the reporting of which would improve the effectiveness and efficiency of safeguards. So in total, we considered 37 different kinds of equipment and material, as well as some installations. Don't let this slide scare you, because in the end, we chose 12 of these as case studies for further research. We chose these case studies because they represented, in our view, particularly com compelling examples of equipment and materials not, including under, not included under the annexes, but which are relevant for safeguards. Now, we separated them into considerations for Annex 1 and those for Annex 2, and so as not to spend too much time on them, I will encourage you to uh, see the report from the project, which is published on the BCDNP website. And I believe that if it's not already, the, a link to the publication will be put into chat. So these are the 12. Uh, I will walk you through the case studies that we concluded um, during this presentation. But very shortly, let me tell the reasons why we considered each of these technologies. And then I'll give a more detailed description of three of them. First on my list are accelerator-driven systems, and this is one of the ones that I'll explain in more detail momentarily. Uh, we looked for Annex 1 at breeding blankets. This is material, usually fertile material, placed in structural components around the core of a nuclear reactor. 
um, our conclusion for NX1 was that while the material in breeding blankets for, for uh, fission reactors would already be subject to safeguards, it would be useful to the IAEA perhaps to receive reports on the scale of operations for facilities engaged in the manufacture or assembly of breeding blankets in order to shed more light on, the, uh, on developments in the nuclear industrial capability of the state concerned. Moving to Annex 2, uh, we looked at complete heavy water upgrade systems and their components. While heavy water is itself already included into the annexes, heavy water does require, require periodic upgrading to remove the buildup of tritium. States can export the heavy water to another country to have it upgraded uh, if they don't have that capability themselves, but we argue that reporting on the export of the equipment required for this process would help the IEA uh, to get a better idea of a country's capability to do so domestically. Um, there is an existing section in Annex 2 that deals with fuel fabrication, um, fuel fabrication plants, I should say more specifically, but it's quite vaguely written uh, in, in my judgment, which is why we've argued that especially designed or prepared equipment uh, should be more specifically or explicitly perhaps uh, described in that section to prevent unintentional underreporting of equipment used for fuel fabrication. Um, especially designed or prepared systems for the conversion of uranium dioxide to uranium tetrachloride. This is another case study that I will describe in detail momentarily. Still on Annex 2, uh, talking about reprocessing, um, Annex 2 covers in, in great detail the equipment required for the Purex technique of reprocessing, which is far and away the most common one. But there are other reprocessing techniques that are coming down the pipeline and may become more prevalent, bearing in mind advanced reactor designs and fuel cycle concepts. We've argued that uh, a component common to some of these methods, such as electrometallurgical reprocessing, um, these are electro refiners, could be included into NX2 to help the IEA better track these developments. Neutron measurement systems have many uses along the nuclear fuel cycle, and this is another one that I'll go into more detail in a moment regarding the reason the board may wish to include neutron measurement systems for process control during reprocessing activities into NX2. Uh, NH3, this is ammonia. Uh, ammonia synthesis converters and synthesis uni units uh, used, are, are used for uh, one process of heavy water production. Uh, recalling that heavy water itself is already included under NX2, we've argued that including this equipment required for one method of producing heavy water uh, also into NX2 would give the IAEA a fuller picture of a state's heavy water production capabilities. NX2 does cover coolant pumps, uh, as, you, as you may know, but it does not explicitly include coolant, coolant circulators. While some may argue that the difference between a pump and a circulator is simply semantic, we've argued that uh, not explicitly mentioning circulators in the existing entry opens the door to unnecessary vagueness, for lack of a better term, which could lead to unintentional underreporting on the part of the state. This is particularly salient, uh, in my view, as, as some advanced reactors are imagined to be gas cooled and gas is, of course, circulated rather than pumped. Uh, additionally, the existing entry includes specifications for standards for what pumps or circulators it does cover, and the circular, the pardon me, the standards included in that entry are are uh, you know, quite outdated. Another technology that we considered for NX two was special shutoff and control valves. These would be used in gas centrifuge enrichment. NX2 includes many components for gas centrifuge enrichment capabilities, but it does not include these valves, which are used to regulate the feed of uranium hexafluoride between centrifuges. And we argue that including these especially designed or prepared valves would help the IAEA to have as complete a picture as possible of nuclear activities. Uh, tritium was originally considered for inclusion, we're back on Annex 1. Uh, and we've argued that it bears consideration again today. As our trooper observed, the mere existence of tritium is a very strong indication that there are nuclear activities going on somewhere. Uh, additionally, it's a component in boosted nuclear, <coughs> boosted type nuclear weapons. So while it does have significant civilian applications, we've argued that including locations engaged um, in the extraction of tritium or in the manufacture of lithium-6 targets used to uh, artificially manufactured tritium 
would be a helpful source of information for the IAEA. And finally, in the quick overview, the last case study concerns an exception in the existing entry in Annex 2 for the export of complete nuclear reactors. And that is an exclusion for so-called zero energy reactors, which are defined as those with a maximum designed rate of production of plutonium not exceeding 100 grams per year. Now, in my view, not only is this sort of an artificial metric 100 grams per year, but more to the point, there is no reason in that I see to exclude the export of any complete nuclear reactor from Annex 2. And as such, we've argued that that exception should be stripped. So like I said, I will discuss a few of them in some more detail. The first case study that I'll discuss is Accelerator Driven Systems or ADS, um, specifically ones which can be used for transmutation, which is the conversion of one element or isotope into another. The concept of using an ADS for transmutation itself, that's not a new concept. This method was initially considered for the US nuclear weapons program due to the, uh, at that time, limited availability of natural uranium. That method was later terminated when ample supplies of natural uranium were in fact discovered. So while the US nuclear weapons program did not use an ADS to produce nuclear material, it did establish the technical feasibility of such a method. Fast forwarding to the 1990s, and we see advances in the power levels for small accelerators and also studies coming from the US Department of Energy that note that two kilograms of plutonium could theoretically be produced per year using an ADS. Uh, a later report uh, commissioned in 2013 by the Swedish Radiation Safety Authority noted a potential of three to four kilograms uh, a year of plutonium produced using an ADS, which of course is more. All of this, of course, depends on the configuration of the ADS, but um, it's striking to me that you know, a few kilograms of plutonium a year, that doesn't sound like much, um, but any amount of unsafeguarded plutonium, should the ADS be concealed, is a proliferation concern. Indeed, even microgram quantities of plutonium are enough to allow experimentation related to the mechanical properties um, of nuclear weapons, and this is things like how much pressure would be needed to compress it in order to sustain a chain reaction in the core of a weapon. So for these reasons, we've argued that reporting under NX1 uh, of, of the model additional protocol on the scale of operations for locations that use accelerator driven systems for transmutation would help the IAEA provide credible assurance that the neutron flux of an accelerator driven system is not misused in order to produce nuclear material. An alternative to that suggestion would be to uh, report on the scale of operations for locations manufacture, uh, engaged in the manufacture of uh, neutron sources that are especially designed or prepared for use in accelerator driven systems. As I mentioned, this section of NX2 that deals with reprocessing does cover various equipment. Uh, that equipment includes uh, irradiated fuel chopping machines to remove the cladding from the fuel so that it may be dissolved the dissolvers for the fuel itself, the equipment to separate uranium, plutonium, and fission products, storage vessels, and the systems to convert the resulting plutonium from form to form, of course, eventually into uranium, uh, plutonium metal. However, peculiarly, in my view, it does not include neutron measurement systems to monitor this process for process control. Um, neutron measurement systems play two roles during reprocessing. Uh, the first is that they are used to monitor the inventory of fissile material in tanks during the solvent extraction process. So that means when uranium and plutonium are being separated from the irradiated fuel. Second, they provide a secondary sort of safety measure. It's a secondary control system against uh, criticality accidents. And for these reasons, a neutron measurement system, which is especially designed and prepared for process control, could be expected to exist in any reprocessing facility. The export of these systems could indicate that reprocessing activities are taking place in the importing state or that the importing state intends to conduct such activities. Uh, one technical expert I spoke with on reprocessing technology was actually shocked that uh, neutron measurement systems specially designed or prepared for process control were not already included. And to be clear, there are many types of neutron measurement systems. And because of that, the especially designed or prepared principle is particularly important to note because neutron measurement systems are used for a lot of things, including by the IAEA to implement safeguards. 
However, neutron measurement systems for reprocessing plants are generally configured to uh, the plant in which they will be installed, making them quite difficult to mistake for other neutron measurement systems. In this regard, uh, we have argued the provision of information about the export of especially designed and prepared neutron measurement systems for use in reprocessing plants may help the IAEA maintain a better picture of the state's nuclear uh, activities or developments, particularly as concerns reprocessing. So as I alluded to uh, earlier, this one is a little wonkier. Um, so let me explain. Um, NX2 covers the equipment used for uranium enrichment using a number of different methods. Um, and one of those methods is electromagnetic isotope separation or the IMIS process. The IMIS process as compared to gas centrifuge enrichment is relatively simpler. Uh, it was one of the things hidden within Iraq's uh, clandestine nuclear weapons program. And the equipment included in NX2 related to the IMIS process includes electromagnetic isotope separators, specially designed and prepared high voltage power supplies and EDP magnet power supplies. Um, so we've argued that it would be worth considering not just the equipment required for that enrichment process itself, but also the feedstock. Um, the MS process uses uranium tetrachloride, which has to be converted from uranium dioxide. Uranium tetrachloride, by the way, is used for um, other applications along the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, and considering the relative, and I do mean relative, um, technological ease related to the MS process, it would be advantageous for the IAEA perhaps to receive reports on the export of especially designed and prepared systems for the conversion of uranium dioxide to uranium tetrachloride in order to have a, um, a fuller understanding of the production of the feedstock for the MS process. As with previous examples, um, I want to stress that this is not about controlling the export of technology, but rather about the IAEA getting as full a picture as possible about a state's nuclear activities so that it can adequately plan and implement uh, and evaluate the most effective and efficient safeguards possible. So that was a quick overview of the three case studies that we included, um, three of the 12 that we considered in the, uh, in the report. <clears throat> but this, of course, inevitably begs the question, how do we actually update the annexes? So I've provided 12 case studies of technology or materials not covered under the annexes to the model additional protocol. As I said, when I started my presentation, our report puts the cards on the table. It is for the IAEA member states, or in this particular instance, the board, to decide whether or not to convene an open-ended working group of experts to deliberate on the technical expert level as to what an update of the annexes should look like. Such a working group would include representatives from any interested member state. The board would then need to choose whether to accept the recommendations made by that open-ended working group. Uh, should such a process be initiated, the member states would benefit greatly, in my view, from the IAEA's perspective on which items it would benefit from receiving reports on. So while these 12 case studies have been uh, outlined of things, the reporting on which I believe would be beneficial to the IAEA, there may be things worth altering which are already covered under the annexes to the model additional protocol or even removing from the annexes. So with that, let me say uh, another thing sort of more bird's eye. I believe it's in the interest of all IAEA member states that safeguards be as effective and efficient as possible. Safeguards play multiple roles in the framework of international nuclear governance. One of these roles, of course, is providing assurance to the rest of the international community about a state's nuclear intentions. So I would think that a state would, all states rather, would be interested in ensuring that the model additional protocol as an instrument of nuclear governance is as up-to-date as possible. As Laura, who will be speaking in a minute, has often said safeguards are only as effective as member states wish them to be. Uh, I also want to say that the analysis contained in the report on your screens uh, is basically us taking the temperature, right, of the situation. Such a review should be done on a regular basis such that the safeguards and the broader nuclear governance communities keep stock of what the technologies are that are coming down the pipeline um, and how those technologies may impact the effectiveness and the efficiency of safeguards. It is my hope that the research contained in this report starts a conversation that I believe is very needed. I should say before we close out that I would like to join Yelena in thanking the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of the United Kingdom for the generous funding that made this project possible. 
And one last thing to say, as I am sure you are all aware, uh, we are in the run-up to the IAEA's Quadrennial International Symposium on Safeguards. I will be continuing my research uh, on safeguards in general and the annexes in particular as we move forward and must uh, shameless self-promotion say that I've already submitted a few abstracts. The deadline for abstracts is March 31st, so anyone interested in this important issue, safeguards in general or the annexes in particular, you can submit your own abstracts and I look forward to seeing you all at the symposium. With that, I will finish and I'm pleased to hand the floor back to Yelena for Laura and Jim's comments. Thank you so much. No, I, I really like your uh, conclusion is in recommendations part. I think it uh, provides a good segue to the uh, two comments that will follow from Laura and Jim but also appreciate your uh, advertisement of the Safeguard Symposium. I think that the agency should take a note how much work I try to do to ensure that everybody knows about the uh, upcoming symposium. But overall, great, thank you. This is a great presentation uh, in the summary of the project. Uh, but I do want to, uh, for us to have time to hear both from Laura and Jane both on their recollections and some other considerations that both in terms of how the uh, model additional protocol and the annexes uh, came about uh, about 30 years ago, 25 years ago, 25, yeah. And they started in 93, but, um, uh, but no, no, nonetheless, uh, let's uh, jump in uh, um, and give the floor to our two valuable experts here. Laura, why don't we start with you? It's my pleasure. And my first comment is I cannot believe it's been 25 years. Uh, I'm far too young for that. Uh, I really liked Noah's report. And I think it's really valuable for two very specific reasons. It clarifies the purposes or the purpose of the annexes to the model additional protocol. And it also offers concrete, specific, and non-political recommendations for their updating, which I think is really important. I've been asked to provide just a little bit of background on the development of the two annexes and Article 16, which sets out the simplified process for amending the annexes. And I'll leave to Jim the more technical details of this. So just big picture, Annex 1 identifies key activities related to the production of nuclear weapons usable material. This annex and the Article 2A4 that corresponds to the necessary information to be submitted was intended to give the agency an overview of the infrastructure that directly supports a state's nuclear fuel cycle. So the agency can provide assurances that these activities were being pursued exclusively in connection with the state's declared nuclear program. I like to uh, analogize this to a jigsaw puzzle. You have a, the cover of a box of a jigsaw and that cover looks like a picture of a peaceful nuclear program. Well, when you have the pieces that derive from a comprehensive safeguards agreement, you have many of the pieces of that jigsaw puzzle. What Annex 1 does is provide some additional pieces to that picture of the nuclear fuel cycle. And if it starts looking a little questionable about whether it's peaceful or not, this is helpful in identifying those outliers. Now, when we were discussing Annex 1, there were really just a couple of uh, substantive issues. And one, most importantly, was how much information needed to be provided. And uh, ultimately it was limited to the scale of operations of these activities where they're being carried out. There was another decision that was quite substantive and Jim certainly would be able to address these in more detail. And that was de the decision to delete from the draft that we had prepared a reference to beryllium, boron 10 and tritium both in the context of Annex 2 and Annex 1. But I wanted to call out the chairman's endorsement of providing information on those items, uh, indicating that this would provide additional transparency 
which would contribute to the greater effectiveness and efficiency uh, of safeguards. And he specifically, this happened to be Jim's ambassador who was chairing committee 24, specifically encouraged states to provide that information. So Annex 2, as you've just heard from Noah, talks about information on uh, transfers of um, specified equipment and non-nuclear material. Now, as, as rightly emphasized by Noah in his report, the purpose of these annexes is not to control in the sense of imposing conditions of supply, the transfer of materials, equipment, or technology, simply to give the agency a fuller picture of the state's nuclear related activities. Remember the jigsaw puzzle analogy, if you got lost. The genesis of the list contained in article, uh, sorry, in Annex 2, that is specified in Article 2A9, was indeed something we called the voluntary reporting scheme. It was a proposal that we developed before Program 93 plus 2 was formalized. Um, and it started with two separate documents the Secretariat prepared for the board. And they were designed to fill gaps on information that was routinely required to be provided to the agency. And our theory was, you know, we bet states out there would be happy to provide more information um, on a voluntary basis. So we came up with a, a proposal for exports, imports, and inventories of nuclear material, and a separate paper on universal reporting on exports of exports and imports of certain equipment and non-nuclear material for peaceful nuclear purposes. In doing so, we referred to the list of uh, EDP items developed by the, the Zanger Committee, the NPT list in IMSERC 209, and also the NSG Part 1 list uh, to IMSERC 254. Subsequently, the Board of Governors approved the universal reporting on nuclear material and separately the specified equipment and non-nuclear material. The list as endorsed by the Board of Governors was indeed the list contained in IMSERC 254, revision one, part one. And the board said, regardless of what the NSG does, uh, we're not bound by the NSG, but if we feel like modifying our voluntary reporting scheme list to accommodate changes for whatever reason, we will consider amendment. And it did so on two occasions. First in December 94, uh, when the NSG modified its list to include uh, a reference to isotope separation. And then later in March, 1996, uh, further amendments that deal with nuclear grade graphite, interestingly enough, given Noah's comments. And those, that list from which the agency eventually drew was IMSERC 254, revision two, part one. For those of you geeks in the audience, you wanna know that. So the big debate in committee 24, in the negotiations of the model addition protocol was what kind of information. Now, many states have licensing requirements for the export of nuclear related items. So the question was, do they report the issuance of export licenses? Do they inform the agency about actual exports? And can they inform the agency about imports? Now, most countries didn't have systems set up to track imports, but they did track export licenses, but it was considered most useful to the agency to know about actual exports of such items. But if the agency received information from a third party saying, hey, I just shipped an Annex 2 item to country B, we could go to country B and say, did you get it? to make sure there hadn't, hadn't gotten lost, hadn't been diverted somewhere else. So um, the question that was raised in the course of committee 24, because not everybody had been on the board before was why this list? So the secretary had explained that this had been a list that had previous, previously been used in the voluntary reporting scheme. It had been endorsed repeatedly in the NPT RevCon in particular in the Review and Extension Conference of 1995 that had just happened. And there was no other list that had been discussed at greater length or in greater detail. 
There was some discussion in the committee on the specific items, but the discussion really related more to the procedures for amendment of Annex 2. However, I'm going to repeat something that Noah pointed out because it bears repeating. Annex 2 was designed to, dis to cover specified equipment and non-nuclear material both that identified in Gov 2629 as amended from time to time and any other items specified by the Board of Governors. And indeed, that's why we picked the title to Annex 2 to read the way it does. It does not refer to single use or dual use. It says this list and anything else the Board adds to it. Okay, so how do we amend these things? Well. Most profoundly, it was important to the Secretariat that we had consistency in the lists. So you didn't have 122 different lists of things that were being reported under the various additional protocols. So um, another issue that came up was, if my country isn't on the board all the time, how do I get input into whether that list should be expanded or contracted? So what do we do about, what do we do to honor the views of member states that aren't part of the board? Um, so these questions were the ones that really raised the most political concerns. Uh, there were also general concerns about export controls, political concerns about the NSG and who decided what materials and equipment would be included. So the first question, amended by whom? Lots of proposals. One was, well, there should be changes identified by the secretary and then approved by the board. No, 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 no. They should just be approved by the board. No, alternatively, let's get them approved by the board and confirmed by the GC. Ultimately, should there be consultation with the state concern? Ultimately, in order to reduce the likelihood of disparate lists and to accommodate the concerns of member states who frequently or almost never were on the board, it was decided that there would be an open-ended working group of experts, not experts appointed by the DG or the Secretariat, not open only to uh, states that had additional protocols. It would be open-ended. And you have a bunch of lawyers in the room. They say, well, what are the rules that apply? Is this going to be consensus or two-thirds majority? The then head of external relations, Mohammed El Baradai, said, the rules that would apply would be the standard rules of the Board of Governors, which routinely provides for consensus decisions, but doesn't require them. And then he added, well, instead of these uh, amendments coming into force automatically three months, maybe states need a little bit more time. Let's make them automatically come into force in four months after the board approves it. Now, when questioned, about the legal acceptability of agreeing in advance to future amendments, uh, the soon to be director general added that they could regard acceptance of the protocol as including a priori approval of the amendment procedures specified in article 16B, such that amendments to the annexes would come into effect automatically without additional ratification. And that, my friends, is how we ended up with Article 16B. I'm sure Jim, from the technical perspective, has a, a, can flesh out more of these issues as well. That's fascinating, Laura. Uh, always amazed by the uh, wealth of information uh, that comes out from this um, kind of historical moments in the development of the safeguard system and particularly the model additional protocol. I haven't realized that Barade was just the head of the external relations at that time. But anyway, uh, Jim, um, I'm going to give the microphone to you now. Uh, thank you, Elena. Uh, let me begin by uh, expressing my gratitude for the invitation to be part of the launch of the uh, BCDNP report. Uh, for me, the report is yet a, another example of the value of the work that the center undertakes. Um, and I would also like to commend Noah for um, the timely, interesting, 
and very useful report. Uh, contrary to the lead up by Laura, um, it's not my intention to provide detailed uh, uh, comments um, on the examples of potential limits to the Annex 1 and Annex 2 of the protocol that are identified in the report. Um, although I must note that Nora do, uh, Noah does a, a really good job, not only in identifying specific items, but in also providing justifications for examples that he provides. Rather, um, I intend to provide a few general observations, which I hope will be useful. And having listened to, to uh, Noah's um, presentation and Laura's comments, uh, I think you'll see that uh, some of my comments pick up on some of the points that they made, uh, as uh, Laura said, because I think it's important that in some of these instances, these, these points be reinforced. So first of all, I, I think it's important to note um, the report's title, uh, particularly the use of the word reflecting, because to me, this word captures the objective of the exercise to consider the annexes of the model additional protocol from the point of view of identifying potential proposals for amendments to them, while at the same time recognizing that there is an agreed process for pursuing such amendments as noted by Laura and as set out in Article 16 of the Model Additional Protocol. In my view, the value of the paper that we have before us today is not to provide a template for specific amendments to the annexes, but rather to provide a catalyst for discussion of whether or not the efficiency and effectiveness of safeguards can be strengthened by amendments to the existing annexes. This could include proposals for both additions and deletions. For me, the discussion will likely take part uh, in, as will likely be part of a comprehensive exercise. It should commence with the technical discussion involving technical experts from IEA member states, as well as the Secretariat. And the aim of that discussion should be to provide sound technical rationale for a proposed, uh, any proposed amendments which could facilitate consideration by the board. It is worth noting, I believe, that we shouldn't prejudge the outcome of either the technical discussions or the board consideration, should there be one. A technical review of the annexes is warranted whether or not it results in changes. And in this context, I think it's worthwhile to make a few salient points as I mentioned before, some of which have already been addressed by either Noah or Laura. First, uh, the concept of reporting information to the IAEA to facilitate safeguards implementation, particularly information on the export and import of nuclear material and on the export of specified equipment and, nu and non-nuclear material, dates back to 1993, as mentioned with the voluntary reporting scheme. So there is precedence. Second, there's precedence within the IEA for ensuring that lists of items subject to such reporting be updated and ensure that they continue to strengthen the effectiveness and efficiency of safeguards. As Laura mentioned, the voluntary reporting scheme was amended twice by the Board of Governors. Again, precedent. Second, as recognized in the report, the phrase especially designed and prepared is utilized in Annex 2 in describing specific items in the Annex. While this is certainly a useful concept, it need not, as been pointed out by Noah, it need not be a condition or a requirement for including future items in Annex 2. The overall criteria should be whether or not such items facilitate safeguards implementation, regardless of whether they are single use or dual use. With respect to Annex 1, as Noah and Laura noted, it was originally intended to provide the agency with an overview of the infrastructure directly supporting a state's nuclear fuel cycle, so that the agency would be able to provide assurance that the activities in question were being pursued exclusively in connection with the state's declared nuclear program. Again, it might be beneficial to broaden that criteria to include other activities, 
perhaps such as extracting or recovering tritium as mentioned in the paper, if they can be determined to be consistent with the objective of strengthening safeguards. Third, I want to endorse the premise of the paper, and that is that it is appropriate 25 years after they were created to revisit the annexes to the model additional protocol to ensure that they remain true to their original objective. At the very least, it would be prudent to examine the advances in relevant technology that have occurred over the past 25 years, building upon perhaps what is set out in Noah's paper. It would also be useful to look at emerging technologies such as SMRs, advanced reactors and the related fuels to see if certain components or items would be suitable candidates for inclusion in Annex 1 or Annex 2. As the paper correctly points out, these considerations must be guided by strengthening the efficiency and effectiveness of safeguards. It is imperative that considerations of any possible amendments to the annexes continue to be focused on this objective. Finally, each annex, but most particularly Annex 2, uses detailed technical parameters in identifying the items to be reported to the IEA. Given the passage of time since the model additional protocol was created, it might be useful to review these technical characteristics to ensure that they remain valid. In closing, I'd like to say that if the goal of this paper is to provide some useful technical insight on possible amendments to the annexes of the model additional protocol, then in my view, that goal has been admirably achieved. It remains to be seen, however, whether it will be a catalyst for a broader technical discussion, which might ultimately lead to the initiation of the official annex update process. I believe that it is timely and prudent to revisit the annexes to ensure that they are current and that they continue to serve the objective for which they were originally created. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I think we believe that too. <laughs> that was the goal of the project. Uh, and uh, thank you for your kind words about the project itself and, and its findings. Um, there are uh, a number of questions that came to us. And obviously, given that uh, current international environment where in some of them related to Ukraine, a war and other issues, However, I'm going to use my uh, moderator prerogative and focus on questions that relate to the subject of the today's discussion, even the limited time. And uh, Jim, since you have started uh, it, um, uh, that uh, discussion and already alluded some uh, uh, to some potential ways how to see a, a process uh, for uh, potential update to be um, moving forward. What I wanted to probably pose to Noah and, and to you and Laura, um, uh, whomever want to uh, answer it, um, to speak about uh, whether there were any previous attempts to update uh, annexes. And uh, if so, what were the results of it? And just uh, who would like to take it? Noah, Jim, Noah, go ahead. I can say a few words and then I'm sure that both Laura and Jim will have uh, you know, much to add on. Um, so there, there's been no open-ended working group created with the purpose of considering what an update to the annexes might look like. Um, there was, I think Jim made reference to committee 24, uh, which was the committee that uh, negotiated the model additional protocol. There was also Committee 25, which was an initiative that um, took place in the mid 2000s. Um, and uh, during Committee 25, there, was, there were many proposals that were considered. One proposal uh, was in fact uh, a, a potential update of the annexes or at the very least considering what that might look like. Um, that did not go very far and in my in my view, the reason that it didn't go very far was because Committee 25 was an extremely, at least my understanding, was an extremely politicized 
process. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that I mentioned, and I think both Laura and Jim mentioned, the process of updating the annexes under 16B of NCERC 540 specifies a expert, a group of open ended group of experts. And in my mind, this means technical experts. And so should um, a future process be um, initiated in, initiated in um, support of updating the annexes, it should be, you know, as, as I said, a very technical process so as to not let the, um, the open-ended working group fall uh, victim to, to politics. Um, that's my short reply. And Jim Laura, would you like to add something? Go ahead, Jim. I can just, I can just, uh, I think that's an accurate assessment. Uh, I think that we all recognize um, that although, you know, the annex is very technical, uh, amendments to them are, uh, uh, involve very technical analysis and justifications. Ultimately, uh, any of that work ends up in the Board of Governors, which is a very political animal. Um, so I think, like you suggested, bringing proposals to uh, change the annexes to the protocol, let alone changes to safeguard agreements, but changes to the annex of the protocol. Um, bringing half-baked suggestions or, or suggestions to the board um, that they're seeing for the first time mm -hmm. without um, doing the necessary work to prepare uh, is, is bound for failure. So for me, that's why I kept harping on the, uh, uh, the need to undertake a series of technical discussions, probably informally at the, at the outset, um, that, uh, that would be amongst technical experts from, from the member states of the agency combined with the secretariat um, to see if there can be any consensus within this group of, of going forward with uh, proposals for amendments. And then if that, bears fruit, uh, there could be a more uh, formal meeting at a technical level to, to solidify those proposals and to write out the rationale and then distribute the paper or that the results of that work more formally uh, to the board members, uh, perhaps via the secretariat um, for their information. And at that time, you can then bring in the actual process if the board decides that we've got this in front of us, let's have a meeting to discuss and see how it goes forward. It may not work. Uh, there, there still may not be any agreement on amendment, but at least I think that the exercise would have been more appropriately prepared and have a greater chance for approval if it's done in a manner like this. And if I could add, these ideas have to find fertile ground. If they don't, the seeds of these thoughts will simply die. And what happened was during those mid 2000s, we were going through an extraordinarily politically contentious time uh, among the member states of the agency. And it just was not possible for them to achieve any kind of consensus on that. So there are two things, a well thought through process that isn't sprung on the board of governors, but also a political, a politically conducive, an environment that is politically conducive to strengthening safeguards. Um, really, a sort of a condition sine qua non for for any kind of further improvement of safeguards. Thank you, Rose. I think there's a great points. I'm going to ask you a very uh, technical question that came from one of our uh, listeners from Victoria Todorova. Uh, do you consider accelerators for the production of radiopharmaceuticals as potential system for possible production of nuclear material? So I guess the question is, is there uh, proliferation significance for, of accelerators for pharmaceuticals? Anyone who wants to take it on? Yeah, I'll answer this in a roundabout way. Um, I, I emphasized in my initial remarks that um, the, <clears throat> the way in which uh, this open-ended working group of um, 
uh, of experts looks at specific technologies um, will be very important. I, I recommended accelerator-driven systems for NX1, uh, but note that first of all, there are many kinds of accelerators for different purposes. And two, the wording of any addition uh, to either of the annexes will be very important for how it is interpreted. And the third thing that I will say is that um, my understanding, and Laura can correct me, is a, a report on the scale of operations for activities that a certain facility is engaged in, which I believe is, is the wording of Annex 1, doesn't have to be a line for line um, description of every single thing that you know, is done at that facility. And my understanding is it can be, it shouldn't be too vague, but it doesn't have to be extremely specific. Um, it is a report on what that facility does. Um, so, so I don't believe the in, uh, inclusion of um, uh, accelerator driven systems would in any way hamper the, the production of radio, radio pharmaceuticals. Um, and the other thing, last thing I'll say, and then, um, you, you know, I think, I don't know if Laura or Jim have anything to add to that is, um, a lot of the accelerator driven systems that we were concerned with may use nuclear material to begin with, um, as sort of, I'm not using the correct word here, but feedstock and that stuff is already under safeguards. The added value of adding accelerators to this list um, is that the IAEA would have a sort of better idea of the scale of operations for facilities that are operating accelerator driven systems should that be added. Um, so that's my response. Thanks, Noah. I'm gonna, if with your permission, Jim and Laura, uh, we can go a little bit over the original time of ending at four o'clock. I think that there are a few questions that I would still um, appreciate you answering. There is a good question coming from Mark Goodman uh, with, uh, that asks, has the IA undertaken any review of what NX1 and NX2 type information has been or would be useful for safeguards relevant indicators? Um, don't know what it means, but hopefully you will <laughs> know. <laughs> Would such a review be a good starting point for board deliberations or launching an open-ended working group? If that's a question that you can answer, let me know. Um, Noah? Again, I'm happy to start. And then um, if, if Laura or Jim have any comments, I would welcome those. It is my understanding that uh, the IAEA keeps tabs on, on this issue, um, you know, from time to time. But um, one of the things that Jim really touched upon is how does this process start? Um, and one of the things that Jim, I think, uh, really emphasized is that the uh, member states would benefit from an agency perspective as to what would be useful for them. Now, how does the process of this open-ended working group start? How does it you know, what is a good starting point? I mean, certainly um, that could help, but it's also very important that, um, uh, that the IAEA and member states are sort of on the same page about this. Um, I think somebody mentioned also something to the effect of, you don't want to surprise the board with something they've never seen before. Um, so um, that, that, that's my very quick take. Um, Jim, Laura. I, I don't know the stage at which the agencies excuse me, the Secretariat is reviewing either the annexes or their relative merits, but I can only underscore what Noah said. The only reason program 93 plus two and the model additional protocol were a success were because of the endless rounds of discussions and consultations that uh, we in the Secretariat held with the member states. We learned as much from the member states during those consultations as I think I like to believe that they learn from us. Never get ahead of the Board of Governors. They will trample you to death, and rightly so. <laughs> I, uh, if I can, I mean, yes, I think that uh, uh, I, in answer to Mark's specific question, I mean, I, I don't know that whether the, uh, the Secretariat has um, um, identified uh, additional um, uh, items or information on exports and imports of additional items that could help them already um, implement safeguards better. Uh, 
it wouldn't surprise me that in uh, carrying out their normal work, that uh, they may have come across some ideas that could be beneficial, but would not go to the extent of putting it on a paper or sending it out to, to the board. Um, that's why I think that, uh, as, as has been mentioned, uh, whatever, however the exercise is initiated, it should involve member state experts and the secretariat together. Um, it should be an exercise that if, if, I mean, there is no point, for example, in a group of experts from member states spending weeks and weeks and weeks on a topic uh, that they think might be useful for improving the effectiveness and efficiency of safeguards, only to find that the secretariat says, well, you know what? Uh, we're not really that interested in that, and we don't see how that would actually help us. Uh, that's why I think it's both uh, having both in the room with an ongoing informal consultation process um, without prejudging the outcome, uh, having a, an open discussion uh, with a common objective in mind um, to make sure that uh, whatever comes out at the end of it, if it's, if it's a proposal, post proposal to amend, um, that there's a rationale that then can be presented to the Board of Governors and can be defended by the member states and also by the Secretary. Thank you. And, 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 and if I can add one more um, observation. Sure. Um, there was a suggest there, there's, there's some, uh, it's important to realize, and I think I was trying to stress this, that although the voluntary reporting scheme and the annexes were based on um, work that was done by others at the time, um, whether it was the Zanger Committee or the NSG, uh, it's, it is important, and I think uh, Laura tried to stress this point as well. The annexes are now separated from any of that original influence. Uh, they are not the property or, of 209 or 254. The annexes are the property of the, of, of the member states and the secretariat in the guise of, a, of an agreement. They can do whatever they want with these annexes. So the fact that um, so there may have been some changes to the documents that originally led to their creation doesn't necessarily mean that those changes automatically should be transferred into Annex 1 or Annex 2. So it's, it's, it has to be careful. We have, we have to be very careful that we're not looking at this from an exclusively an export control perspective, but we have to look at this from a safeguards perspective. Thank you, Jim. This is a very important message to, um, to add to the previous discussion, particularly about the need for uh, first the technical experts to work on it and also have both member states and the secretariat involved uh, in this process. I'm gonna ask one uh, last question um, and uh, when we close the, the seminar afterwards, um, like what are, the, what are the stakes to states that uh, don't have additional protocol at the moment in force uh, in this potential update of the annexes? How would you uh, describe that? Um, Noah, would you start? Would you like to start? Yes, sure. And thanks for the for the question. Um, I'll be short because I know we're already a little bit over time. But um, it's something that I think is important to 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 outline and maybe a good thing to finish on. Uh, as I said at the end of my you know prepared remarks, uh, I think it's in the interest of of all states um, that the safeguards system be as effective and efficient as possible. Um, it's you know one country concluding additional protocol is not an event in isolation, right? Every additional protocol that is, enters into force is something that improves the overall health of the safeguard system in my view. Um, but if you're a country that does not wish to conclude an additional protocol, there is no reason that I can think of why you wouldn't want countries that do have additional protocols 
to have them as up to date as possible as concerns the annexes. Imagine you're a country, your country X, and you're very concerned that country Y might be doing things that you don't consider to be entirely honest. If that country has an additional protocol. Why, why would country X have any issue with an update to the annexes that would provide a better and more complete picture of that of the other country's nuclear activities? Um, I, I think that it is positive for the safeguard system in general for um, uh, the prospect of updating the annexes. I think that it would be a positive development in some regional contexts. And the last thing that I'll say is, um, this is not quite the answer to the question, but uh, Laura authored a study just before I joined the BCDNP that um, also showed that um, non-nuclear weapon states with additional protocols actually benefited internally in the country in some cases by increasing coordination and things of that nature as a result of having implemented the additional protocol in their country. So. Um, I, I think an update to the annexes would be a positive step for everyone. Um, of course, I'm the author of the report, so <laughs> I'm a bit biased, but uh, that's my two cents. Great. Uh, Laura and Jim, uh, if you'd like to add something or maybe some final points before we close. I think Noah's summary was excellent. You know. Who's, who's going to support him except the person out of whose computer came the, the first draft of this document? So um, uh, he, very well done, Noah. Really kudos on the report and on the presentation. Very clear, very direct, and I hope it will be a catalyst. Great. Uh, Jim, uh, I didn't see your unmuting microphone. I assume we can... I can join to Laura's uh, last comment, and actually you coined it, uh, that the, uh, we hope that the study would be a catalyst for at least further discussion and some uh, movement in this area. Because uh, the as I started our webinar, uh, it has been at least for a number of years um, a subject of discussion among those experts uh, looking at the impact of uh, more recent technological developments on the safeguards and on uh, expert controls. And, so, and the subject that uh, was brought up is something that we, uh, as a community that is concerned about the about non-proliferation, uh, about the efficiency and effectiveness of safeguards to, to pay attention to and try to shed light on the uh, current status and uh, the adequacy of these annexes. With that, I'm really uh, grateful both to you, Jim, and to Laura for joining us today and sharing your insights and uh, providing recommendations on a number of issues, including on possible ways to um, see how uh, this process could evolve. And also grateful to our VCDNP team and first and foremost, Noah, for the excellent work on the report and uh, for the, today's presentation. And many thanks to all of our listeners uh, and viewers for your um, attention and staying with us and for uh, continuing to be interested in, the, in this uh, subject uh, matters. And my apologies to those whose questions I was not able to add. But it's a fascinating discussion. Everybody, please stay safe and healthy. And all the best. Thank you.